This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, November 15, 2012 session in our series on green technologies and transportation. Want to welcome everybody here today. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center that produces this series of uh, nine uh, seminars. And uh, like to especially recognize Sunbridge Partners for providing additional financial support for our series. So we'll have some refreshments outside, thanks to Sunbridge. Be sure and uh, stay around and meet our speaker and, and uh, talk with each other uh, after the session is over. Also want to mention that, yes, next Thursday is Thanksgiving Day, so of course we will not have a session then. Two weeks from today, we have Mr. Steve Center, who is a senior executive in charge of the Environmental Business Development Unit for Honda Motors. So uh, we have uh, EVs coming back in two weeks, and then uh, our final session in the series will be December 6th with um, Mr. Lou Thompson, who is very high up in regard to high-speed rail and advises uh, the state of California on high-speed rail issues. We're going to ask what California should learn from Asian high-speed rail. Um, today, we're covering a segment that so far we haven't gotten to very much in the series, e-bikes. And to come and present to us today, we have Nick Rothman. And Nick is known really well in two different technical areas. First is plug-in hybrid conversion. So Nick co-founded a company called Green Gears in 2007. And Green Gears is basically pushing uh, smart transportation to the consumer. One of the things that Nick is currently involved in is uh, doing all the installations and customer support for A123 systems, plug-in hybrid conversion systems. Uh, he's the lead tech on Toyota Prius plug-in hybrid conversions for PG&E, Google, San Francisco City and County, UC Davis, and a lot of other organizations. Um, Nick also, in the e-bike e space, is founder of a company called Extreme Green Machines, which was a large bicyc electric bicycle and scooter rental shop in uh, San Francisco. Nick currently directs all of the e-bike um, maintenance work for Blazing Saddles, which is the largest bicycle rental organization in the United States, I think. Um, they're up in the city. And um, he's the author of two books, The Electric Bicycle Handbook and also The Homemade Plug-In Hybrid. So uh, Nick, thanks very much for coming today. We did the introduction, but currently I'm maintaining a fleet of electric bikes for blazing saddles. You may have seen these bicycles cruising across the Golden Gate Bridge or somewhere else. This is the largest bicycle rental company in the United States. And what's really cool about their operation is they've found a way to use e-bikes profitably. So e-bikes... Uh, you know, as a mode of transportation, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to really break down the economics of one mode of transportation versus another. But in terms of rental, this is really a profitable game, and it allows them to really invest some real money into buying e-bikes, maintaining e-bikes, trying new technology. Um, Blazing Saddles, seven locations in San Francisco, the largest bike rental in the United States. So. When we think about the bike market, just to kind of quickly go over it, you look at that, this is 2010. Um, clearly China is where most of the e-bikes are. Um, if you look at that little blue sliver, that's the United States. So 
you know, we're not a very big piece of the pie with uh, the e-bike market. So I'll start with the Chinese e-bike. Now I'm going to go over the, the other e-bikes out there and, and other things, but it's interesting because the Chinese e-bike, if you look at this, they are really unique. I mean, I never see these types of e-bikes in the United States. They just, they really don't make it over here. Um, these racks, for instance, I mean, this bike is totally set up to be a very functional vehicle. Um, it's a lead acid battery. Uh, if it, by the way, if anyone has questions, I'm uh, open to taking questions as I'm presenting, as well as in the end. So another thing I'm, I'm looking at on this bike that I think is interesting, it's hub motor, and it's, it's really unbelievably inexpensive. I mean, this, this type of uh, Chinese e-bike, some of them are selling for $200 in China. I mean, it's hard to even really understand how they're able to produce them at such low prices. And uh, they're just selling millions and millions of these. So here's the motor. Now, this, this is, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over some of the points on the Chinese bike, technical aspects of it. So. You see here, this, this is a Chinese-made motor. The Shimano you see written here, that's actually just the sprocket set. So that's uh, made by another manufacturer and screwed on there. But the, the Chinese hub motor um, is the direct drive type on most of these Chinese bikes. And it's extremely simple and very cost effective. So this is actually the technology that's moving most of China. And it's, it's incredible how it really doesn't get much attention because it kind of goes under the radar. It's, they're kind of funky and small and no one's really you know, talking about them that much, but they certainly are uh, out there in huge numbers. Now, if you look here, here's a hub motor being made. Now what I find interesting about these is in terms of the production, they wind them by hand. And we really don't hand wind motors in the United States or Europe or Japan. Um, but they've just found it to be more cost effective. It's, and it's, it's a very functional method. They just have a you know, simple kind of old world system where they, they kind of use these pieces of folded paper as a guide. And it's just like weaving a pattern. And they, they just crank them out that way. There was a nice row of finished uh, motor stators here. Now, in the United States, we do import these hub motors. And uh, one manufacturer I was working with as a technician, actually requested a production change and said, we'll agree to buy 100 units of your motors if you make a very minor change. I mean, nothing that would require new molds or anything. I think they just wanted one of the, like a little resistor placed on this card. And the manufacturer responded by saying, we make 10,000 units a month. So we're not going to make any change for 100 units. And it kind of brought the reality to us that you know, buying a hundred units seems like, you know, an order worth noticing, but to them, they're just, their production levels are almost unbelievable. Nick, what's the difference between an e-bike and a scooter? An e-bike's going to have pedals. Okay, okay. Is there anything in the size of the motor that's also, or the power of the motor that is kind of a difference? The motor power level is, is kind of by region. Okay. So it's, it is interesting how they break that down. The United States is the most generous. They're, they're giving you 750 watts, which is pretty significant. If you ride a 750 watt e-bike, it's got a lot of power. Um, the Japanese actually uh, 
define it as a ratio of how much power the bike is putting in compared to the amount of pedal power you're putting in, and then it's capped at a, at a certain top limit. The Europeans just say 250 watts. So everyone has their own kind of set of guidelines, but basically you'll see an e-bike will have pedals and a motor of a certain output. Okay. If you look, these are electric magnets, and these are permanent magnets, and the motor is just energizing the electric magnets in sequence and making it chase. I mean, it's, there's nothing new happening here. People were doing this 100 years ago, which is part of the reason it's it's really just so cheap to make these, especially when you're making them by hand. And one thing we have noticed uh, in the, the e-bike world is the tolerances really don't matter as much as you would think. Now, when you have a car and you're crash testing it and you're driving 100 miles an hour on the freeway, tolerances are important. But when you're going 20 miles an hour down the road, um, I've seen some of these things where just the... You wouldn't think it would run. Some of the, the holes have been drilled by hand at times or production errors, like little fixes, and they just happily chug down the road and no one really knows the better. So it's, it's just incredible what you can get away with. I mean, so here we are with the Chinese, the internals of the Chinese electric bike hub motor. And this outer shell has the holes for the spokes. Here you see them here. And it's just lined with magnets, and they're glued in by hand. And then the inner core here has these windings on it that are hand wound. And then the only really, you know, uh, modern electronics in here are these little, these three little sensors, and. Uh, They've actually recently devised a system to, to even get rid of those. So when I look in this thing, it looks like, like a toaster or something inside to me. I mean, it is just dead simple. And these can, uh, especially the versions without the sensors, you've, they have uh, bikes that they've run through creeks, you know, then, then flooded. It's, it's not waterproof. It's just that it's so simple, it doesn't matter if water gets in there. It just leaks back out. There's nothing, just metal, you know, coils of wire. So, um, the, really, the, the moving parts on this motor are the two bearings on the axle. That's it. It's just metal coils and magnets. Where's the lead for the battery? That'll come out of the other side. Okay. Through, usually through the end of the axle. Uh, now, a little twist on it that they've come up with is a, a small gear set. We're going to, this is a planetary gear set just because of the formation of the gears. Here's the sun, the planets, the ring. So, this is the, an identical motor that has just a miniaturized gearbox stuffed in the shell with it. And this will be on like a higher end Chinese e bike. What this does for you is it allows the motor to spin at a higher RPM. And the way I describe this is, if, imagine you had a, a car and you had to just choose one gear. And that gear happened to be fourth gear. Well, you would need an incredibly huge, powerful motor to make a car just drive around in fourth gear. So because of the lack of any gear reduction in uh, an electric motor that's just simply built into a wheel, it's basically like be, it's a direct connection. So it's the same as your fourth gear on a car. So that's the reason they have these huge heavy hub motors on a lot of these Chinese bikes is because there's, there's no way to put a gear reduction. So 
they've devised this, still cheap and simple, but requires quite a bit more um, in terms of keeping track of tolerances, parts count. So a motor like this is probably, um, you know, direct from China, maybe in the $200 range. And the previous more simple version of the motor is maybe more in the $40 or $50 range. So, or even less, I mean, you know, there, there are other, I think the, the higher quality Chinese stuff gets imported here, but some of the domestic stuff is maybe, you know, $20 and $30 motors that, that they're able to produce. There's another keystone to the Chinese electric bike is the lead acid battery. And another tried and true technology here, um, it's very effective. I mean, it's, it's not the best item to, to get Americans excited about electric bikes because it's heavy and you're not going to have much range, but they sure do work. And I've, you know, I've always expected that the Chinese would uh, change over to lithium batteries, but they seem perfectly happy with those, uh, you know, 120 million electric bikes on the road. They're, you know, pretty much all lead acid. And, uh, one of the big reasons behind that is there's just, there's no electronics here. Again, you could literally submerge this battery in water and nothing would happen to it. It would be fine. For a bike like this, about how much of the time would somebody be pedaling and how much of the time would they let the battery take over? Well, I, it's interesting because with the... Here, let's go to this. This is the control system on the Chinese electric bike, the throttle. So you're acting as the computer. There is no software. So if I want to go far, I'm, I'm not going to twist it very much, and I'm going to pedal a lot. And people just kind of learn by doing, and they, they realize their limitations by testing it. These these uh, lights don't really accurately show you how far you're going to be going just because they're not a sophisticated computer that's really counting the amount of energy going past. It's just kind of a dumb light system. So it's basically going to tell you your lead acid battery is dead when you can already tell it's dead because the, all the power is gone. <laughs> Nick, have you ever ridden one of these things? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've got so many electric so, bikes. When you're pedaling, is it really clunky? I mean, is it really hard oh, to make it go? Just rickety, clunky, squeaky. Uh, you know, the brakes don't stop very well, and but but you it's know, pretty they, reliable. They, they I mean, do work. Yeah. yeah. What? Uh, so in the U.S., I guess we would want kind of a more sophisticated look and feel. Oh, definitely. The people that ride bikes just don't want something that's gonna, no way. Yeah, they, they won't go for it. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't rent these, these bikes. Now, here's what, what we're going to have in our bikes here. This would be nicely packaged in a shell, but this is a lithium battery pack. So if this were a good quality pack, these cells would say maybe Panasonic, Samsung, some major brand battery manufacturer. And one of the issues you've got with lithium batteries is this battery right here could be 98% full, and this one might be 93% full, and this one some other percentage. They're all in the same range, but they're not just totally perfectly even in terms of their charge. So what they've done to compensate for the natural imbalance of all these lithium batteries is this, this circuit here. So this circuit we're calling battery management system, BMS. And you have a row of resistors. So if you imagine that you have a battery that you want to bring down to the level of the other batteries, because one battery just is too full, and it's going to eventually overcharge because this bike is charging. And you want to fill up all the batteries, but you don't want to overcharge any battery, because then you've ruined that cell. And there goes the, that battery pack. So what they do is, if you'd imagine attaching a light bulb across one of these cells, 
the light bulb would illuminate and draw power from the cell and then it would give the other cells time to catch up to it because it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be losing charge as that light bulb is connected. So instead of a light bulb, they're using these resistors. There's one resistor for each cell and the little circuit can turn each resistor on independently and that is the predominant strategy for lithium battery management. That's in my laptop. Um, that's in every electric bike with a lithium battery. That's in DeWalt drills. That's in uh, Toyota Priuses. It's, it's just uh, you know, the way they do it. So it's, it's effective, but again, it's complicated, adds cost. These lithium batteries, of course, just blow away the lead batteries in performance. Um, you're talking maybe a fifth the weight. It's just much more pleasurable to, to ride with without that huge weight. Yeah? Uh, just like an order of magnitude, like how, how far would a lead battery take you and a lithium battery take you? Like one mile, ten miles? Well, I mean, it, uh, a lead acid powered e-bike, you're probably going to be in the 10 to 20 mile range. And uh, the lead, uh, lithium powered e-bike, you could probably push that out to more like the 20 to 40 to 50 mile range. And even with a you know maximized range of 40 and 50 miles, that would still be a lighter weight bike than the lower range lead bike. What sort of speeds? Can you speak up? Okay, yes. Er, we'd like everybody. To okay, <laughs> assuming uh, when you mentioned range, but assuming, say, on average, 150 pound person, what sort of speeds uh, are? Well, I mean, people have built 100 mile an hour electric bikes. They're they're out there. Just in as your average consumer product is going to be limited right at 20 miles an hour on the nose because that's the federal law. But Maybe you mean what kind of speed gain would you see from switching to lithium? No, 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 no. Just, I'm just curious what the speeds are. All, all, all the American domestic e-bikes just power cuts at 20 miles an hour. Except yeah. for the state of California, which has two categories of motorized bicycles now. I own one, and it's legal at 30 miles an hour, so long as you have a motorcycle license and a helmet. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'll tell you that 30 miles an hour is a wonderful addition <laughs> when you're weaving in and out of the lazy bikers here on campus or other, uh, uh, you know, you're mixing in partly with traffic or something. The ability, you're going 20 miles an hour and you want to accelerate, you can do it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a real safe, you know, we've all seen the pictures of the hordes of the uh, bikers in China all puttering along at the same modest speed, we don't we aren't there yet, so an individual like me has to watch out for himself and having this extra power uh, very much with that kind of uh, lithium battery system, uh, it really matters. So if anyone's thinking about one, I'm happy to talk. It's upstairs. Uh, well, and it's expensive, but I will rec I will recommend the thirty mile an hour version over the twenty. Yeah, good point. Is, yes, there a, is there a differential in the charging sort of characteristics between? Oh, yeah. I mean, the lithium just wins in every category. You'll charge a lithium battery in half the time or less. I mean, you can quick charge them. The lead batteries just can't absorb the charge very quickly. It's a, so you'll see these lead batteries sitting on the charger for eight hours, and it's, you know, 95% charge, but you could leave it for a few more hours to get the last bit, and the lithium's just... Boom, they're done. You know, they're, they work great. Excuse me. Yeah? So you mentioned earlier that Chinese people are typically happy with the recent uh, lead acid battery now, but do you yeah. think that's primarily because of the cost or? Cost and durability. Durability. Mm -hmm. So if you have a battery that costs, you know, three to five times as much and doesn't last any longer, in, in fact, it might have some issue if you were to drop it and this board cracked or it got wet or it's not just solid as a rock like those lead batteries that are practically impossible to break. In terms of the uh, cycle life, the lithium ion batteries uh, last maybe a thousand times uh, of charging, whereas well, the lead acid batteries could last a couple 
hundred times or so. I'm, I don't see that in the field. Where I don't ever see a thousand cycles. Some of them are saying three thousand cycles. I don't know. I mean, I've read the reports, but I'm not seeing it. I don't think the lithium's really. I I think you five hundred cycles is what you should expect from a lithium. Three hundred or yeah, but close. Yeah, a little bit less. So, you go ahead. You first. I was going to add, ask how much additional cost does the lithium um, ion battery pack add, and do you think the consumer will pay for it? If they're so why? Well, European, Japanese, and American consumers pretty much are into lithium batteries. Uh, and it's an easy upsell. And it, it, you know, it's two and three times the cost for the same capacity. I guess not the question how much so for the entire bike or for the battery itself. So what would how much what would the cost be? What would the differential be? So you could have a two hundred dollar lead battery and a six hundred dollar lithium battery. So uh, I'll, I'll cover some more bikes from you know other markets. One last thing before you get to that. Um, one of the complaints that you hear from people in the U.S. that are kind of selling bikes and so forth is that the maintenance requirements for an e-bike is are very high. You've always got the thing in the shop, always working on it. Yes, that's true. Um, <laughs> It, the in um, with the real simple cheap stuff in China, uh, do you ever hear anything about well, the maintenance I think, situation? There? I think one of the differences is that once you get to a critical mass where there's a, a real market for a product, the shops will come. So, you know, in Asia, there are, they have e-bike shops that are capable of repairing them on every corner, pretty much. I mean, because there's just millions and millions, hundred okay. over a hundred million in China. So. They have that covered. One of the big issues here is, um, you know, there are plenty of regular bike shops. You'd never really be stuck, you know, with a issue with your pedal bike, but there's yeah. just no one to work on them because there isn't enough of a market. So it's this kind of chicken and the egg thing. But as any vehicle, it's going to need service, definitely. Who, who is the market for the U.S. for a 20 mile an hour bike? Or as he says, the thirty mile. I'm not sure exactly. It's hard to know. Well, of course, to that question though is that uh, at the big annual event of bike manufacturers and dealers that took place in Las Vegas about six weeks ago, called yeah. Interbike, yeah, which you're probably going to mention, uh, four major manufacturers. Specialized, Schwinn, Trek, and Giant all introduced new e-bikes. Yeah, yeah. In the fifteen hundred to low two thousand price range, I think. Yeah. So they're all fishing for an answer to your question. Yeah. And there was so there's no known answer. And as usual, there will be the early adopters. Uh, and I'm one of them. <laughs> Except my bike is custom made. So I don't know. <laughs> So he, what we have here, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through the rest of the pieces of the Chinese bike is, this is the controller. So what this does is it interfaces between the battery, the throttle, and the motor. And with the, the type of motor they're using, you have to have a controller. It's not just adding some functionality or you know cool features. If you don't have this, these motors won't run. That's because everyone's using brushless motors on e-bikes and with without the brushes you need this little box and again it's just literally amazing they're making these and selling them for twenty dollars and it's something that you look at it and it seems like it would cost a couple hundred bucks I mean there's some real high-powered electronics in there and once you get to this you know tens of millions mark with production they really worked out the bugs in these, and there, you know, there are various versions. So these have really come a long way in the last five or so years. Uh, here again, we have the the throttles that are going to connect to that, and that's just that's the the interface with the the rider. Uh, is there any uh, way they can uh, 
and charging the battery when they go, when they go downhill. Some of them will, yeah. If you apply the brake on the Chinese bikes, yep, you apply the brakes and you'll feel an engine brake kind of a sensation as if you downshifted your car and you know you're slowing with a nice even drag and it's returning energy to the battery. So that that works really well with the brushless motors and it's it's built into a lot of those twenty dollar controllers just as a basic function. It's not on all of them. So here. Any safety issues in the past with the Chinese bikes? Well, there's, yeah, I'm sure there are. I mean, there's safety issues with everything, though. I mean, it, they, the frames will break and things will happen, for sure. You but said the frames. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just couldn't quite catch. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here, what we have a totally different animal, so here we have a totally different animal, the Japanese e-bike, and. I mean, if you look at this, the engineering is really incredible with these. And I just want to describe what they're doing here. They don't have a hub motor on this bike. There is no hub motor here. The motor is here. And what, what you're able to do, instead of being stuck in fourth gear, like I was talking about with the big, heavy Chinese e-bike, you, you've got a, um, you know, like a nice Shimano internal gear set or a derailleur. And you, as you shift the gears here, you're also shifting the gears that the motor is driving. So now you can have a motor that, in, that weighs maybe a third the weight. It's just more efficient. It's more complex. Um, it, these, these Japanese bikes are also extremely durable, but not, not because of simplicity. They're just highly engineered. So here, here it is. This is here's the pedal, and the chain actually runs over this little drive sprocket and then back down. So this guy turns with the motor, and since the pedal crank goes through this motor box, it knows how hard you're pushing on the pedals, and reacts with that kind of uh, ratio I talked about. That's that's. Uh, determined by Japanese law, where they say, well, if you push with five foot-pounds, the motor can push with 10 foot-pounds, but no more. So it's got torque sensors and software and, you know, a very engineered product. Panasonic and Yamaha are the biggest makers, big names. Um, you know, these things are engineered well. And again, they've worked the bugs out on these. Uh, their lithium batteries are excellent. They, they have these systems that lock it in place. This is where the battery sits on all the Japanese e-bikes. It's almost standardized. I mean, they, they pretty much have it right there, which is excellent for the weight. Um, it's also, you know, just a, a good secure place to put it. It's locked in place. Various frames. They've they've kind of been plagued with the the frumpy look with the Japanese spikes, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's it's what people buy. Uh, they're they're selling again, selling millions in Japan. Actually, Yamaha did more electric two wheelers than than gas two-wheelers last year in, in Japan. So the numbers are big. They're taking it seriously. And they're, they're not just doing the e-bike the e thing to, because they think it's interesting. It, there's real money in it. That they're increasing or kind of just doing well in yeah, terms no, of market increasing. share? Yeah, yeah they're increasing. Yeah. yeah, I just read a, a, a report from one of the big uh, vendors of e-bikes in Japan. And they said they were they were growing 10% a year. And uh, they're battling it out, Panasonic and Yamaha. They're just advertisements everywhere. They're, it is a big deal in Japan. Did I understand correctly? You were saying that they're selling more e-bikes than they are motorcycles? Yeah. Okay. Yamaha sold in Japan. Now, you have to realize in Japan, if you want to get a motorcycle license, it's no laughing matter. I mean, you're going to spend a few thousand dollars and take courses for weeks and weeks and it's 
you know, the registration and everything, it's a total pain. So there's, it's kind of understandable why a lot of people would maybe just go the easy way and grab the e-bike. Where do uh, electric scooters fall into the continuum? Well, here they don't have, do you mean the, the little like kickboard types or the, the Vespa type? Like the Vespa types. Here they're having a tough go at it because once you get a motorcycle license, now you're free to just grab any motorized vehicle that also requires insurance and a plate and you can get a parking ticket. So at that point, once you've gone through the trouble and expense, a lot of people will just get the Honda scooter, the gas powered Vespa, because one of the huge advantages of the electric bike is that you don't need uh, registration, you don't need insurance, there's no plate on it. So that falls away when you go with the Vespa style. So that's killed the market to a certain degree, for the electric at least. One of the things about the electric scooters is that they used to be able to take hills better, right? Because they had more power, is what I well, was used to. But if you got the licensed one, yeah, you yeah. can you then can it's put like a, lot a of motorcycle, sure. Yeah, but so the seven hundred and fifty watts will really climb a hill. Okay. The Japanese are two fifty, and but they're they're just so efficient, you know, that it it's really it's you have to pedal though is the other thing. You can't just sit there. There is no throttle on these. It's just sensing how hard you pedal. So you can't sit there and just cruise. You're always pedaling, which is kind of annoying <laughs> if you're into e-bikes, you know, and what's the deal? So that's the law. So they have finally kind of decided to make some e-bikes that, that look a little sportier. Um, an interesting thing about the Japanese take on it is... Um, you know, you can have a cool screen, you can, you know, learn what you're doing, you know, how far you've gone, battery state of charge. One of the things I find interesting, though, is that they really don't obsess on the quality level of their bike components in Japan. If you look at these bikes, they've got just really cheap brakes and derailleurs, just super low-end stuff. Like, you know, this this is basically a Walmart bike with their drive unit on it. And it's great because the thing costs $1,200. It's really cheap. Um, here, people are really, in the United States, people seem to be very conscious of, you know, well, do I have Dior XD or is it Dior LX? And in Japan, people don't even seem to know what component is on their bike. And they're able to sell a much cheaper bike. Of course, it doesn't you know, it's not as polished in terms of the drivetrain, but it's just the, the market over there. These are, their kid carrying options are just excellent. I mean, the, a lot of the people may have seen the cargo bike thing that's, that's kind of gaining some momentum here where it's a, you know, a long tail bike and it, they have like a seat attachment. But with these Japanese bikes, they really, I mean, there's seat belts, there's little wind visors, um, they have whole catalogs of options, and, and the, the thing is that when you're selling millions of units, you can work through the, the initial cost of having a whole book full of accessories for your product line. Where here, we haven't quite hit that, so we're still kind of, there aren't as many choices. So here we go, European e-bikes. Um, the Europeans, an interesting thing, they've got some really nice e-bikes. This is the smart um, belt drive. It's got a three-speed hub integrated into this motor. Really nice controls. Uh, you know, it's an expensive bike. I think this is going to be 4000 bucks or 3000 bucks. It's going to be expensive, but, you know, they've, they've got some nice stuff. What's going on with the fork? Is there something there, or is that just style? That's just the look. Yeah. So they think about the look a lot. The Japanese, it's just whatever performs the functionality of carrying the intended cargo is perfect, you know. But but people really want want a nice looking bike in Europe. And one interesting thing is, 
I've seen a lot of these. This is a German-made frame, top-of-the-line components, and that same old Panasonic drive system in the middle. But now it's a $3,000 bike. And it's, yeah, it's better than that Japanese bike, but it does have the same motor and battery, exactly. Like, there is no, it's, you know, it's not even branded differently. It says Panasonic right on it. So the Europeans said, well, you know, we don't want to ride with these junk components, but we do like the Panasonic drive. And they said, well, let's just make something exactly like that that's, <laughs> that's uh, ours. So the Bosch, and the Bosch is, is going to be on a lot of bikes soon. There's going to be a Cannondale with the Bosch system. Uh, they're they're going to be out there. It's exactly like the Panasonic and the Yamaha. It feels the torque that you're putting into the pedals. You've got a pedal. It's got the screen as an option if you want the, you know, the information. The battery goes right in that same spot. It's got the lock. So that's the, the Euro take on it. And... And you're still not going to be able to cruise. You still can't cruise, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> the, now, I rode this at Interbike. It's, it's very polished. It's really nice. Um, so, you know, I've got high hopes for, for this system and the bikes that it comes on. What's the price? It's, it's still kind of unknown. I mean, I've seen some guesstimates, but I think it's, it's going to be on a lot of 2013 bikes. They just kind of released that. So here we have the American e-bikes. Now, this is a moped-ish uh, setup. You know, you, this is all about the cruise. I mean, you really, you could pedal sometimes if you felt uh, like you wanted to, but the huge tires, it's got a lot of drag. They've got this roller here. I maintain a fleet of these, and these are about 80 pounds. They're pretty heavy. And, uh, you know, heavy hub motor, but people love renting these. I mean, you just hop on and just, it doesn't require that you go a mile or two an hour before the motor is active. You can just turn this thing on and just crank the throttle, and it goes from a stop. So it's, it's basically a moped. I mean... A moped that falls within the laws of electric bikes. You don't need a license. Cruisers are big in the United States. So branded cruisers. This is a Pedgo. Again, they just grabbed a, like a direct drive Chinese hub motor. All the components are Chinese, but they've just kind of reworked it into a more stylish package. But none of the American manufacturers seem to be making any of the components at all. <laughs> like maybe, no, I don't think they're making any of the components. So it's, you know, it's the, the rebranding thing. I mean, they, they take a lithium battery. I've seen various brands on all the different American bikes. They kind of shop around, test some stuff, make some deals with the manufacturers, and then that's, that's their technology. And interestingly, one of the phenomenons in the United States is the conversion bikes. As Americans, it's interesting, the conversion thing, the custom bike is big in the United States and Australia, some other areas of Europe, some, some areas of Europe as well. But, uh, you know, in, in Asia, people aren't, they don't want to make their own bike. They, they want to buy a bike. In America, uh, people just love making these conversions. So some of the makers of these kits have really done well. They've actually done, had more profitability than a lot of the finished bike makers. You'd probably, if you did a lead acid kit, you'd probably spend maybe five or 600. And if you did a lithium kit, you'd be up 1,000, 1,200 for a low end. You know, the sky's the limit, of course. You could, you could go big and spend a lot. So the kits, you get a box. 
It's already built in a wheel. This is shipped straight from China. This is the motor wheel from a bike that where they may, they're making millions of these. So they're not making any changes to allow this to be a kit. It's just this is the way it already is. And someone decided to market this as a kit because everything's in one box and it's a bike wheel. The batteries, now, one of the big differences is that uh, you're going to get from one source the wheel, motor, uh, controller, throttle in a box, and it'll be a separate source for the lithium battery because these two things don't usually come together on a Chinese electric bike. So they're two different places making them. And from my experience, these are pretty solid. Whereas the lithium batteries that you're getting in the kits, since they're not pushing those millions of units, there are some bugs. You know, there'll be some batteries that just don't last that long and uh, don't really live up to the expectations. And then we've got just, this is the meat of the American market. It's not very, uh, clear that, that these are out there. I, never, I don't feel like this would be the hottest seller, but these just really cheap electric bikes actually do sell pretty well on Amazon and Walmart and um, lead acid. Kind of a, it's not a Chinese bike, but it's just, these are $500 ready to go. You know, you just pull it out of the box and put the front wheel on. So, so you, you're calling them Walmart bikes. What kind of brands do they actually have? Or like is it the Walmart Schwinn, no, brand? It's Schwinn, okay. Mongoose, GT, which okay. are all owned by the same company now. <laughs> so one of the things that's happened is the American market has not performed to expectations. So I've seen one heavy investment e-bike startup after another fail because the sales aren't what were projected and what that's resulted in is a lot of acquisitions um, you know this company swallowed up that company so at Interbike uh, we didn't nobody it was hard to tell who was working for who anymore these some of these long established companies had just got swallowed up in the last year so the guys that are doing all this Walmart stuff there they were bought by a by a large uh, European company, I can't remember what country they're from. Dutch. Dutch? Okay. And, you know, they've got big, presumably what would seem like a good established market. Like, they, being the leader in the United States, you would think that they would kind of have some pretty decent cash flow, but they still haven't really, they, they continue to kind of be fooled by this huge expectation that didn't, doesn't always pan out. So, if you had to give like two or three reasons why the American market isn't growing like people are expecting, is it just bicycles are kind of for kids and, and not really for serious? I mean, the serious riders are putting a lot of money in, but, yeah. um, you know, is, is it kind of product image or is it safety concerns or what, what do you think? I, th I think that it's growing. It's just not doubling every year because I think uh, there's nothing, no data out there that tells me it should double in the next year. It's just growing happily. You know, it's got a nice 5 or 7% per year growth that's, that's steady. But I think, you know, expecting these things to sell is in huge quantities suddenly is, I'm not sure what makes people think that'll happen, but it, it hasn't been happening. Uh-huh. I bought two of the I <coughs> two of the Iacocas e-bikes, and the lead acid batteries in them uh, were dead in less than six months. So I, who wanted to be an enthusiastic promoter, I got the entire city council of Palo Alto to ride my e-bike. But six months later, I I had to tell them, you know what? It's died on me. To me, there's been a massive shortage of product in this country for uh, leading edge consumers to try to, fit, to play with. If you can find him and have him do a custom uh, modification 
Now there you got something. But in terms of the, the open, over-the-counter market, there, to me it's been very, very poor on the supply side. If I can take a shot at that too. Go ahead. I, I think partly, I mean, the, the bike distribution channel in the U.S. Is, is really through bike shops, right? Independent bike shops. And that, that's a world of, of passion, right? I mean, those, those people kind of like live and love bikes. And, you know, that's the meat of the market, like you said. And that's just not a product that speaks to anybody who is that passionate bike shop retailer. And so I think they've just struggled in those retail channels to kind of find a home. I think that, that's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's something I'm, I'm thinking is that the countries that you listed that have you know higher demand, those countries are you know there's a much denser population there, and whereas in the U.S. you have this uh, a lot of suburban areas that are very spread out where you the way you the only way you really can get around is by driving. So I'm wondering if like the only places that you can really address are you know for this type of a product this you know maybe a city atmosphere that's more metro. I don't know. If that's no, actually, we can look at that a little later, kind of country by country. I've got some some recent data on it. So, I mean, if you've traveled to any of the countries, I'll show it may bring to mind why they're working well in some places and not others. So, finally, we do have some really high end bikes here. I just assembled one of these uh, about two days ago, and I was pretty impressed. It's a $15,000 electric bike made in Colorado. It's, you know, very well sorted as you would expect for, for that price point. It's a crank drive and it does have a throttle. And it's 750 watts and it, it really does work great. Handmade one by one. Audi e-bike. Wow. This, this one got a lot of press. I mean, this thing is just incredible. This bike has a wheelie mode where it will do a wheelie on its own and hold it. Meanwhile, an alarm goes off so you realize you're in wheelie mode if you want to flip it off, if you don't know what's happening. <laughs> this thing is just incredible. It's a, uh, 20 miles an hour as well. So what they're doing on this high-end stuff is they have like a road trail switch or other ways to kind of uh, get around that 20 mile an hour limit. This, this bike actually, in all fairness, these guys came before the Audi bike. So the Audi, you know, it seems like you're getting a lot more for the, your money, but they're a huge manufacturer and really for Audi, the press release related to this was worth the entire development cost. And, you know, the Black Trail group, they're trying to actually, you know, make money on each bike. So they had to charge quite a bit more. But it's, you know, all carbon fiber, pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> Optibike, the, the $15,000 Colorado made one. They call themselves the Ferrari of e-bikes. A lot of the, the super high-end stuff is about a custom, super low production quantity crank drive. Because now you've got, you're through the gears, you can change the gear ratio of your motor, you don't have to have a motor that's as heavy as a brick, and you can get the most out of your power. It's the high performance setup, and so they've got, you know, these motors that they're, you know, they'll have a few motor engineers on staff and they really, you know, make the whole thing. So also I thought I'd go into energy consumption a little bit because it is, that is one of the things that, that's really incredible about the e-bike. It is so efficient. Just the platform even the, the lesser efficient Chinese e-bikes, it's just incredible what they do. If, if you kind of get a feel for energy, like in the electric car world, people talk about kilowatt hours a lot. And uh, it's, it's just almost negligible what you're going to use to charge an e-bike. 
because it, it feel it seems like logically it would be some quantity of energy because it's replacing so much work that you would normally do pedaling. But the the vehicle is so lightweight. You know, you're driving around in a car that's 200 times your body weight, and that's that's where all the energy is going. So with the, you know, when you have a 50 pound e bike, it just doesn't take much energy to move the thing around. Yeah, just for compare. Number three there. <coughs> That's true, and I have essentially retired our family second car and my Yamaha motor scooter in favor of my e-bike, partly for cost, partly for convenience and a variety of other things, but uh, that cost thing is very real. No more trips to the gas station? Very convenient. Yeah. Just for comparison, the uh, Tesla performance pack is 85 kilowatt hours. And so yeah. they claim that that will give you 300 miles now yeah. on a good day, right? Now, of course, that's a whole car, but think about it. One kilowatt hour is giving you 50 miles on a yeah. bike. Yeah, it's just... So you may, you may wonder, where is this electricity coming from? This is worldwide, so it's, yeah, it's coal, pretty much. Uh, that depends on where you live. North America, conventional. There's some renewable. Uh, I mean, the point I would make about all this is if you wanted to find a renewable solution to charge your e-bike, it wouldn't be very expensive and it wouldn't be very difficult. But then again, if you didn't, you still wouldn't be burning much coal to charge your e-bike because it's not, it's like leaving the light in your closet on while you are away for the day. I mean, it's just, it's almost like you wouldn't even see it on your bill. but. I mean, you could probably do a lot more to conserve energy with just, you know, buying a smaller TV or something. I mean, I don't know where, where to start, but the e-bike would not be an, an energy hog among most of the other household appliances you're going to have. So the energy source is worth considering as a something to know about, uh, but it's important not to forget just how efficient these things are. Yeah, they had a greater uh, ratio of renewable to conventional. <laughs> Is that just all hydro? Biomass. Biomass? That's um, the cell water. I believe they do some type of. They're in ethanol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, this is 2010. 21 million uh, that. They did in that year, but they're, the estimate there's 120 million on the road because that's just how many that one year. Europe 700,000, Japan 400,000, United States 300,000. I mean, we kind of have a lot of people considering we only did 300,000 units. So, you know, I I don't I'd be interested to see how this looked if you adjusted for the population, because, uh, you know, Japan a lot of people are buying electric bikes there. Yeah, you figure 130 million people in the population versus 250 or 60 in the U.S., right? Right. And there's... So, now this is interesting. So, Pike, Pike Research, which is a reputable research firm, they're thinking about the next five years or so, six, five years, six years. Um, Pretty much 7.5% per year, nice and steady. That's what they think is going to happen. So, I mean, if you read a headline that, you know, by 2018, there's going to be an, an additional, uh, you know, so many million e-bikes, that could be misleading. It's actually, it's just a nice steady growth that they're projecting. Pretty much all the regions are kind of steady growth. This this is this is us down here. It's just you know they went a little farther with it. At this point, they're they're going 15 years out or so from now. Uh, so they broke it into two lines. The aggressive, yeah. I mean, it shows a lot of growth, but it's just. Is it the aging population that makes it slow down? I don't know. 
That's a I good have question. a feeling that around 20, you know, 22, 23, you're starting to see the population age, and so these might be less popular with that. Now, I think the, the kind of boomer aging population, that's, that's the bulk of the market. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, uh, I'm just noticing why the why the line suddenly slows down in See, 2020, what, you know, or 2025, and what people with the just seat of the pants kind of uh, guesstimate on what the market is going to do. This is this is what people think it's going to do. Oh my God, it's going to go through the roof. But it's, I mean, <laughs> so this was really, to me. An important statement that Pike Research made. So, do you see any uh, sign that the Japanese domestic, the Chinese domestic makers, are going to try to jump into other markets? Well, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're so they're, aggressive in market in selling units that I don't see why they wouldn't. I've actually seen a model where you have a Chinese product that's not going to Amazon or Home Depot first, where they've actually got a decent website, and you have no idea this isn't an American company reselling Chinese merchandise until you finally click ship and you go, oh, three weeks to get here? That's kind of <laughs> odd. Oh, well. But I'm starting to see that with, with products that I buy through American retailers anyways. So I think they will be able to make a jump into our market without having a, a major... I guess part of the issue is whether the domestic growth inside the Chinese market is going to be so much that it takes all of their production capacity to keep up with that. I don't know, because they don't really need big machinery investment. They're making this stuff by hand. They just keep yeah. more people, you know, crank it out. But I, I think it's probably true that there is very little chance of uh, North American or European e-bike selling in big quantity in China. Where the the opposite is, even true. though Audi has a great brand. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's about that's it. For thanks very much, Nick. I do want to open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, go ahead. You know what's that? Thank you very much for very exciting stories and all the I'm very curious about it. Uh, what uh, uh, brought you uh, for the pursuing this technology? What is excitement for you? Because I have some friends who are really excited about the you know, e-bikes in, in Japan. They enjoy themselves very much. Uh -huh. But I don't think they love like eco or resource kind of you know, issue, but just, just having fun. Yeah. And also like in a like city like steepy city like Kobe, it's yeah. very convenient for yeah. the whole life. So, for me, you know, you want to, through this you know, technology, you, you, you want to emphasize on like resource or energy issue or something different, like changing lifestyle or human society context or whatever. So I want to know, you know what kind of context you really uh, love and feel excited. Well, uh, personally, growing up in San Francisco was motivation to find a, a better way. I, you know, cars towed, parking tickets, on and on and on. Discovered the e-bike and felt more mobile. Of course, I could take the streetcar around, but I kind of want my own transportation. And it was really a, been a fit for me for years. I've had just dozens of e-bikes, and, and I use them. And they're effective for me to, to move myself around. So that was seems to make sense. I think it, they'll, they'll make sense for other people out there, of course, too. Just to kind of interrupt for a second, I've, in terms of who's in the audience, I think we've got at least a couple of people who are actively involved in the e-bike business. Are you Adam? Yeah. Adam Fulmer with Faraday Bikes. Would you say just a second about who you are and what you're doing? Sure. Uh, thanks for the chance. Great talk. So my name's Adam. Um, I'm the founder of an um, e-bike company based here in Palo Alto, actually. So we make uh, kind of on the higher end of the uh, U.S. domestic market, um, a bike that we're, you know, we're really sort of um, 
trying to approach it from the philosophy of designing a bike that people who love bicycles and love riding bikes can, can really get behind. So it's a beautiful, um, clean, elegant uh, electric bike with a relatively light assist, kind of more of a, a European style. Um, yeah. yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah, I saw it in your bike. I, I wanted to bring one, but there, it's in New York right now. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, we're, we're FaradayBikes.com, um, and yeah, happy to talk. So, oh, great. And you've made several comments today. Could you identify yourself and tell us just a little bit about your bike? Are you doing this as a business, or is this strictly your own? Uh, my name is Jeb. <clears throat> I went, I'm a 40-year-ago graduate from the business school. I'm doing this strictly on my own because I think the internal combustion engine is a disaster for short-range trips are completely irrelevant and unnecessary, at least on flat ground. Uh, it's not so good when it's cold and wet, but uh, I just turned 70, and I would like, I want literally thousands of people to experience the quiet, the power, the fun, the social connection. Uh, it's, it's a, I also happen to buy serial number 5,107 of a brand new little computer uh, in 1978 from a company named Apple. <laughs> so I consider myself an early adopter when I can be. Uh, so I, I look forward to chatting, chatting with you and so forth. And I again say, my bike's upstairs for anyone who wants to look at it and touch it. Okay, great. Is anybody else involved in making or selling e-bikes in the group? How about riding e-bikes? Who's ridden an e-bike? Okay. Uh, anybody have any kind of comments about what the experience was like? Why aren't these things more? Why aren't they more popular in the U.S.? Well, if you want to exercise, <laughs> why, why don't you ride a bike? Ride a bike. Yeah, that's you know that's the reason that I don't have an e-bike. Uh huh. And uh, I have a related question, which is, you gave the the cost per charge, but really the batteries over, let's say, a year cost more than the electricity, isn't that right? Yes. About how much is a lead acid battery, and it's what, every six months, perhaps? You might have to replace well, it? Well, I mean, every car or any vehicle is just wears the parts out I as you go. That. It depends on, you could make lead acid last two years, you could get two weeks out of it, probably average, maybe an easy year out of them. Nick, can I, ask for a, can I ask for a comparison? An automobile lead acid battery runs about four years and right. costs you a hundred bucks or two, right? Right. So what about one for a bicycle? Well, the bicycle, it's going to have a harder life because it gets drawn down. Uh-huh. So you'll have... Uh, you know, a shorter lifespan significantly. Okay. Like a car okay. battery, if you do everything just right, you're only asking for the smallest little drop of energy to crank the engine over. Yeah. And you'll see as your car battery gets old, you leave your headlights on for just five minutes and it's it's over, you know. Yeah. And, and then that's that's your clue that, that it's getting to the end of its life. But the electric bike starts to get really annoying because it's, it, you know, your range is dropping each... And that happens within a year, usually, or...? Well, I mean, it, there's a lot of uh, variables. Like, with a lead-acid battery, the battery actually starts to corrode inside when it's empty. It's as if you had, you know, a, a piece of steel in salt water. Yeah. That's the chemistry when it's discharged. When it's charged... It's not eating itself alive. Yeah. So if you leave your lead acid battery sitting there empty, it it just rusts away inside. So it's kind of a factor of, you know, how much time did it spend sitting there not full and how much time did it spend full? So if you're really diligent about plugging those lead acid batteries in right when you get off the bike, you can get, you know, a good, you know, three, four years out of a pack. You see golf carts get treated well a lot because there's a, you know, there's a cord right with the parking space and they get a long life out of the 
the pack and it's always it's on a fixed loop so it's known where it's going to start and end and it's car number seven goes in parking spot number seven and there's the charge cord the e-bikes tend to kind of sit there someone took a, a ride forgot to plug it in so that's when you really kill your lead acid battery in the six months okay so my point is it's just that people shouldn't expect to have a car or a vehicle that runs for 10 cents a day that just is not realistic and right. people shouldn't go into it with the idea that oh here's my great and uh, not to reply directly to the gentleman over here but your vehicle didn't die the battery went dead you know and, and that's an expected part of the cost and my point is just what is that cost and it's totally it's more like 50 cents a day than it is 10 cents a day is that not it? isn't that right i you know i don't know i have to kind of pencil out the cost i mean it i mean just you, for like ballpark right it's like like a typical two-year life maybe 600 bucks so 50 cents a day with charging on top of that. I mean, it's, you know, un under a dollar a day. I think it's kind of, if you look at the net net compared to insurance, maintenance, tires, oh, sure. it's, it's, sure. it's cheaper. It's not that sensitive. Yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I've seen so many variables, you know, like with the, some people that are just going forever and ever, and other people, it's one thing after another. And, you know, I, sometimes I'm not sure if it's because of their riding style or did they just get a lemon, but, you know, as I was a technician, a mechanic at the Toyota dealer, and people would buy a brand new Corolla, and the thing was just, it, you're not expecting any problems, but it would just be one thing after another. There, there are lemons out there, and so there's just so many variables, but I think if you're going to have, if you're going to own and operate your own vehicle, definitely there are going to be a lot of costs associated with it, e-bikes included. But the charge data is just I think to important to to realize that you know it is in terms of energy consumption very efficient. So are we going to see new approaches to charging? Uh, I things think, like yeah. direct things to you know your own little solar panel. I've seen yeah I've seen a few cool examples. You know I think it could it, it wouldn't be very expensive or costly to uh, or, or complex to to set up solar charging for an e-bike as compared to you know some of the setups I've seen a, a Tesla with a solar awning over it it's yeah. cool but it's you know you're you're spending a lot more money to go solar on that car and there's a lot more involved in it yeah and would you say in the US uh, there's so many automobiles on the road either bike or e-bike you always don't feel very comfortable to share the road with an uh, automobile so you wouldn't to expect the uh, market of the bicycles to go up very much as long as yeah. you have to share the road with uh, so many other yes. Yes. Although I do think we've seen a lot more uh, bike lanes appearing. I mean, some of them are kind of, if you, you sort of have to have a death wish to ride down them. <laughs> you know. But uh, I do think that you're seeing a lot more. I've been fascinated to hear that Blazing Saddles is so successful in San Francisco. And, you know, you take it around and, and you go for a day and, and rent the bike for a day. You don't have trouble parking, which is a huge issue in San Francisco. And, you know, you can go out, take it out across the Golden Gate Bridge a little yeah. bit. And, you know, that's pretty neat. Actually, I saw your hand first. Go ahead. Is the only motivation for lead acid the cost? Because if you're going to compare like lithium ion efficiency and the energy density, it's just it's incomparable, right? So if you're talking cost about like the lifetime and durability, in terms yeah. of just like physical shock type issues, like well, crashing the e-bike, um, things like that. Oh yeah. Definitely. Especially it doesn't have the, the circuit, you know, the, the circuit. The circuits. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it it's it's something that could be engineered out of the the equation. Like the the Panasonic battery is in a really nice hard case. You can drop that thing. It is, you know, the way they've made digital cameras where the circuit is designed to be dropped. But when you have kind of a first gen setup in terms of just the physical layout of the battery they are they can be sensitive to I think I think it's like worth 
remembering that a bike is actually in pretty severe environmental conditions. Yes. Maybe even more so than a car because you don't have all of the suspension to kind of keep vibration yeah. from getting even worse. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to end the formal part of the session today, and we've got some refreshments outside. Please join me in thanking Nick for a great talk.